Good morning, everyone. This is Sam Allred. I bring you greetings. I'm in my home office of Heber City, Utah, and it's just a beautiful winter day today. Thank you for joining me. This is a special presentation to just explain and share what our Emerging Leaders Academy program is. And I thank you so much for joining me. I've got 45 slides, and I'm going to go through them in probably about 35 minutes and try to give you a really good understanding and overview of what this program is. It's been around for a long time, but certainly our need right now is just, I'm, I'm calling it the current flood of retirements. It's the baby boomer bubble that's, that's moving through. We have never as a profession gone through in the history of our accounting profession gone through what we're going through now. It's just a case in point. I, I spent the last two days with a firm in a, in a shareholder retreat and they've got 24 partners, 24 shareholders in the firm. And to give you just some idea of how a baby boomer bubble can affect a firm, they had two partners retire in 2020, and they have nine more partners that will retire uh, probably in the next five years. And you look at the impact of retiring so many baby boomer partners, and it has impacted every single firm. So uh, it, it's become a huge issue across the profession. And and honestly, th there's concerns that we have, and one of them is that firms have not taken serious enough the responsibility to properly prepare future leaders. I, I, I just want to highlight the, the properly prepare future leaders. It's not about do we have people we can vote in. It's really much more about have they been carefully, intentionally developed and prepared to be great partners. Perhaps even as one managing partner, a dear friend put it, better partners than we were ever when, when we entered uh, the firm or entered the, the, the profession in, in, in the sense of being a partner in a firm. So have we been uh, intentional in our development of those individuals? And that if, if we do that, that bodes obviously extremely well for the firm and the firm's future. Uh, well, there's a there's a lot of leadership programs, and this is I, I don't want this to come across wrong. I'm not trying to diss anything out there, but I want to point out th there's a lot of programs and, and that that we see that are called leadership, and, and there's some consistent things that concern me about those programs. And, and I'll just be honest about them. Number one, and maybe first and foremost, they ask way too little of the participants. It feels too much like a boondoggle. It feels like, you know, uh, come to nice places, listen to speakers, read books, share thoughts. It, it, and to me, if you want to see a lot out of somebody, they got to put a lot into it. I, we, ELA came about, and I, and I got to be honest, it came about reluctantly because I had so many firms that were clients and managing partners that were dear friends that came and said, we need you to do leadership development. My thought back then was, gosh, there's, there's all kinds of stuff local and 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 and, and within our profession and and, and many times th through their through their state's chapter or whatever they had leadership programs and what they kept saying was we're not reluctant to spend the money we put people in all kinds of programs what frustrates us is we're not seeing a change in them and that's what caused me to really look at leadership through a different lens to say how would it need to be structured to really create a change in the individual, the change that's desired. Often they desire the change as well as obviously the, the leading partners in the firm that enroll them in the program. The, the firms, the, the programs create a disconnect from the firm, meaning if, if the individual receives all training away from the firm, all, all training separate from anybody in the firm, they can become disenfranchised with the firm. They, they can hear, here's how things ought to be going, but I come back to the ranch and things aren't that way at all and I'm frustrated from it and it creates a disconnect. The learning experiences happen in big doses several times a year. I just look at leadership, and this can sound strange, but I look at it like an exercise program. I mean, if 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 my plan to get in better shape was to, you know, I say to myself, "Gosh, Sam, you're so darn busy. You can't you can't afford to go to the gym. You don't have the time to go to the gym uh, every day." Or, or multiple times a week. Look, put it on your calendar. Get absolutely committed. Go three times a year, but 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 go all day. I mean, and get, be the first one and the last one to leave, and three times a year. Anybody that that, that hears that plan would roll their eyes and, and think, man, I got a story to tell everybody for life, and this guy's going to kill himself. 
I, I just got to tell you, if the learning program won't it work as an exercise program, it's not going to look work as a learning program, and and that's a concern that I saw in in a lot of programs. And then the focus is more on things you do than what you need to become. I'll explain more about that. And then the, the fifth one was they're just expensive. I mean, when you look at the flood of retirements coming and the need to really prepare leaders, there's a lot of leaders that need to be prepared. And if the costs are excessive, then firms are making that choice. Guy, we can, you know, how much do we really want to spend and what can we afford to do? And we got 10 people that need it, but but because of the cost, we're going to give it to three or whatever. So I, that those were the five concerns that we saw. There is a belief that we have and have shared for a long time that firms ought to do most of their own leadership training. When when firms, it's almost like apologetically, they'll say, gosh, Sam, we have a leadership program. And I just applaud them and think you ought to have a leadership program. Every firm of any size that can afford it and can rally the, the resources to develop their own ought to do that. The, the, the challenge still remains what happens, and, and I've had so many uh, managing partners tell me, here's the problem. When we create one, because of the effort and time and, and energy it takes to create one, our, our thought is, that's it. Every, everybody goes through that. And then they acknowledge very easily that, wait a minute, now there is a difference between our rock stars and superstars and everybody else. And and, and at the end of the day, have we watered down a program? I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean-spirited, but have we watered down a program in order to, for it to fit everybody that doesn't necessarily stretch our best people. And that, it doesn't provide the proper training experience for our best people. And I just need to point out, that's what ELA is at its core. It is not a program for every manager and every senior manager and every new partner. It really is a program for the rock stars and the superstars at those levels. It is a program for the best and brightest at the manager, senior manager, and early partner level. And most of the firms that have participated for years, that's exactly how they see it. That's exactly who they enroll into it. They're not putting every manager, senior manager, and partner into it. They're putting those who arguably are their very best and will gain a huge benefit from a very rapid rise in skill, talent, ability, confidence, and that's what the program will do. It's been around since 2007. There's well over 100 firms that, that, that currently rely on the ELA program to d develop their people. It uh, generally has five to 600 people at any given time in it. It's probably a bit lower than that because of last year's pandemic, but we expect that to turn right around to be where it's always been. It's been very successful. And let me just tell you how we measure success, because it's not by what we think we do. We think we're really good at what we do, but the, the, the way that we largely measure success very simply is, what do we hear? First and foremost, what do we hear from the leading partners that have enrolled their individuals into the program? I, I, I'll just refer, I got a, uh, this was last year, but I got a email last year from a managing partner of a top 50 firm in our profession that that embraced ELA probably, um, it's been five, six years ago now. And, and, and out of the blue, he just sent an email and he said, Sam, we, we were discussing the people that we have in ELA and that we put in ELA since it started. And, and, and we were having a discussion about them. And I just felt like I wanted you to know we've seen a significant uptick, that was his words, in every single person that's in that program. We're absolutely committed to it. So it's, it's those comments that we receive regularly and have received for years now that is one measurement we use. And then certainly another vitally important measurement is the individuals that have been through it. What, what, what has it done for them? Not just, hey, thank you for the opportunity. That was really enjoyable. It, it, the, the far more meaningful uh, uh, feedback that we get is this has made a huge difference. I, I had a, a, a partner in, in, in probably one of the top 20 firms in our profession that that is is um, being picked to be one of the leading partners in the firm and, and manage a region. And, and um, she came through ELA some time ago, graduated probably two or three years ago, and, and just reached out and said, Sam, I got to just tell you that that every single day in my career, 
my thoughts are influenced by what happened in ELA, by what I was taught in ELA, and now how I think and how I act and what I'm doing. And I just wanted you to know, in case you don't know, it made an enormous impact in my career and in me as a leader. Those are the those are the the consistent uh, remarks and feedback and interactions that we have that 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 we use as a measuring stick to tell us we're on the right track and this has been highly successful. So I'm going to go through a couple things. I want to talk about principles of leadership. Knowing the concerns about programs, I shared five concerns. How did we design this? What's the focus of it? What are we really trying to do? And then I want to talk about just how does the program run? That's the overview. I'll share a slide with some key dates. Uh, it, the program runs on a fiscal year, so it's, it starts in May. So I'll, I'll share some slides of some key dates and then respond to any questions that you might have. Just feel free at any time to just chat them in and I'll respond to any of those questions and I'll go quickly through this. I wanna start, as I talk about the principles, I just wanna give you the singular focus of the ELA program. It, it, it literally, it, it, it all could be boiled down into one pithy statement, if you will. It, it's to help any of the participants that come into ELA, our goal is to help them understand get committed and know how to become a high yield, low maintenance leader. I just want you to think about that just for a second because that is, that's the crux of it. When Susan reached out and called and said, Sam, this, the program's made such a huge difference. She said every single day, I think to myself, Susan, what, have, what do you gotta do today to be high yield and low maintenance? And, and, and if you can understand that the, most partners of firms have spent way too much time, in their opinion, and, and arguably it's true, spending time dealing with partners who are outside the guardrails, who are frustrating, who are, who are demanding or are causing more maintenance in the firm, time of people in leadership seats to spend trying to deal with the issues and frustrations and whatever. And there's a lot of ways a partner can be high maintenance, but it's maddening to, to uh, partners in leadership seats to have to deal with partners that are high maintenance. And then low yield, or there's partners that are low yield, that means they just, they don't produce. They're not leading successful endeavors, including themselves. They, they're either not hitting the kinds of numbers individually and as a team that they lead or whatever, and it's constant state of worry. And so that's the singular focus of ELA is, is to teach um, participants that are in it, how to be high yield, low maintenance leaders, how to be a high performing partner is another term that we use, but that is the singular focus of ELA. Here's the principles that we use quickly. Learning's got to be continuous. So, so it's delivered in regular doses throughout the year, monthly doses throughout the year. There's always something we feel like they need to be learning, and then they've got to very quickly apply what they've learned that's the fastest way to change behavior and performance and understanding and build skills is you give a dose and then you apply it. You give a dose and then you apply it. And that's the ELA program. Um, the, the, the application becomes critically important. It, it's, it's how do they apply what they've learned on an absolute regular basis. So, and, and I'll explain that as we go, but literally every month they have a training and at the end of the training, they have a responsibility to set a goal of what they're going to do about what they've learned. And, and that's, that leads to rapid development of skill and talent and confidence and ability versus the big doses a couple times a year. They've got to have a current firm leader attached to them participating in the training and the accountability so that they stay connected to the firm. They need that not only from a local accountability standpoint, but they need that from making sure they're connected to the firm. And I'll explain how that works within the program. Uh, ELA very simply is a work program. It, it, it is a work program. And, and I'll go through and, and, and respond to any questions about that, but it's not a boondoggle. So it, it's, gotta, it's gotta be appropriately demanding and it has to stretch every single participant in that program. All growth comes when we get outside of a comfort zone. There is no growth in a comfort zone. And, and, and so often in our profession, 
people's growth is, is stymied in such a significant way. You know what the biggest impediment of growth is in our profession is spending an inordinate amount of time doing stuff you already know how to do. That is our profession to a T. And listen, I respect it and love it, but it, it's not that it's not flawed. And that's one of its big flaws. And so ELA inserts itself in a very real way to ensure that the individual in an intentional way is feeling the butterflies, is growing and stretching by getting out of their comfort zone. Growth won't happen without it. The learning experience has to be customizable. If you've got hundreds of people in it and they're all different makeup and they've got different disciplines and they're perhaps even on a different track, even though they're perhaps all on the track to become a partner and a high-performing partner, there's so many different tracks and strengths and weaknesses and whatever that there has to be a, a program that's highly customizable to meet each individual's needs and ultimately meet the firm's needs. And I'll explain a bit how that goes how, why, how that works to be so customizable. You've also got to be able to measure the progress of each individual. It ought to be highly no, noticeable and, and, and very measurable. The, the program's got to be affordable. And I'll share numbers and all of that in, in this. I, I'm, it's an open slate, and very transparent, trying to help you understand what the program is. But it has to be affordable. And the notice that says require minimal travel, listen, if Travel is expensive. Having just got back from a flight last night that was uh, very expensive, travel's expensive. The, the flights and the hotels and the meals and everything's associated with it. So it, from its very design, it was never designed, even pre-pandemic days, to be a lot of travel um, because of the expense, adding the added expense of that. And then lastly, Participants need to network with each other. Listen, this is this is so obvious. I know you get this. If you've got over 100 firms in the profession, and if their singular goal is put our very best people into this program for three years, then it's logical. There's an enormous benefit by those individuals that, that are the best at their firms, interacting, becoming friends, becoming lifelong uh, 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 networked uh, friends, with other best people on the track to become partner or already there in other firms across North America. And, and it becomes a vital piece of building a really strong network that honestly can be really, really helpful to an individual throughout their career. So there's a lot of effort made to, to help them network with their peers within the ELA program. So let me just walk through it quickly, uh, the, the key aspects. Number one, every participant needs a guide. That, that, that's first and foremost, is that you're not in ELA without a guide. And the guide is a respected leader in your firm. Typically, doesn't have to be, but typically, the vast majority of the hundreds of guides in, in the program, they're partners. And they're well-respected partners in the program. And a partner might guide more than one participant. It's, it's, it's rare that they're going to guide more than Two, we have a few guides that guide three participants, but, but guiding is, is somewhat demanding. I'll talk about that in just a minute, but most uh, participants have a guide that's guiding just them. Uh, it, there are some, a, a good handful of, of those that, that a, a partner's guiding two individuals and a few where a partner's guiding three individuals. The guide's going to work with the participant throughout the program. They're going to meet with them on a regular basis. They're going to help them set individual goals and accomplish those goals in a project. And then we provide guidance and support for the guides. I'm going to come back to the advocate in just a second. We do guide training. You're going to see that when I, when I share dates and calendars or whatever with you. Um, I, to date, I've, I've been the one that's done all the guide training since 2007. I, I would imagine this this uh, next fiscal year, Jeremy will begin to do some of that. But we, I, I've been told for years, this is the best coaching training in the profession. I think it's very good. Every trimester, every four months, I give a different guide training to really help guides understand what are the things you can and should do to make a huge impact on the participant's career. And and so if, if, if a guide comes in the program, they're going to get an in, introductory guide webinar. All of these last an hour, and they do have CPE, but they're going to get an introductory guide webinar. And then over the next three years, 
they're going to get nine additional guide webinars that are all different that in a sense teach them how to be a world-class coach for the individual that they're guiding and and um that that's what we do and that's all built into the price of, of each individual that comes to the program that's not separate that's not additional but each person in the program has to have a guide an advocate um let me go to the next slide and talk about that uh, first of all the pri the guide's primary role is to hold the participant accountable for accomplishing the things that they commit to do within the, pro the, the framework of the program that will really help them be a high yield, low maintenance leader. It says the firm should also consider adding an ELA advocate. There's no cost for that. If they probably enroll more than just a couple people or have more than just one guide, if a firm only puts a couple people in and they only have one guide, then the guide could probably be an advocate uh, there's no cost to, to enroll an advocate, but the advocate is really uh, the, the the primary role is to administrate the program, make sure everybody has on their calendar, make sure the meetings are being held, make sure they know what's coming up next, kind of all of the logistics, if you will, of the program. And it helps uh, most of the firms of any size that are putting multiple people in have had an advocate It's the same advocate for years. And the person that knows the program understands it knows when the deadlines are, knows what's happening, make sure it's on people's calendar so that they're not missing out on what's going on within the program. That's the role of the ELA advocate. There's actually training for that advocate. I'm not the one that does that. I, I think that's Georgia or Kelsey that, that provide guidance and help for the advocate, but uh, a firm ought to consider having an advocate. Somebody typically from either the uh, uh, learning and development side of the firm if they're that big or just administrative side of the firm if it's a smaller firm that uh, is connected to what's going on in the ELA program. We do most of our training through the leadership training forms. Um, they're they're one-hour webinars. Uh, I, I lead a good portion of those and Jeremy Clopton leads a good portion of those and we're both just excellent instructors and, and it provides us the forum to discuss the key principles of leadership and then every leadership training forum ends with a responsibility for them individually now set the kind of goal that will stretch you against what you've learned and help you develop additional skills and growth and confidence and ability and so on the participants receive in advance a pdf of the presentation the the, the questions to consider um, the, the, they, there's three questions on every leadership training form. There's a section within the leadership training form where we actually have assigned in advance individuals, peers, people in the program of each year of the program to respond to questions and, and their peers listen as key people. Their picture comes up on the screen and you hear them responding directly to the question that they prepared and thought about. So that they're hearing thoughts and ideas from their peers of what they've done and what they're going to do with this particular principle of leadership. So there's some interaction. It's not just lecture and receive. There's interaction in each one of those leadership training forums. We record them uh, for two reasons. One, not everybody makes the live one, if you will, because of hundreds of people in conflicts and schedule, although the training, the dates are put out there a year in advance. But things come up, and we understand that. We also record them because often participants go back and say, I want to re-listen to all or part of that leadership training form. So they're put into a library called Online Progress Tracking, a system that we've built, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. So here's the leadership training forms, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, just, uh, again, interest of time. You can go back and look through these, but but there it is in the first year. Our focus in the first year is uh, personal effectiveness and client management. So you'll notice right up front, we talk about how do you really get good at setting and accomplishing stretch goals, worthwhile goals? Uh, why is it so important to understand the concept of being a high yield, low maintenance firm member? Uh, how do you really use your time wisely to, to be able to get done the most important things? And, and within that, how do you prioritize so you can get the most important things done and so on? And then we switch mid-year and the focus becomes away from them as an individual to client management because that's a critically critical part of being a high yield low maintenance leader is being really good at with the clients that you serve and 
and, and not creating problems or issues, but capitalizing on opportunities. Year two, the focus starts out on team development. How do you develop others around you? And then it switches to business development. Um, how, how can you get really, really good at generating business? And what's the right way to do it? And I think there's an enormous benefit we have in teaching that within this program. And then year three is all about leadership and, and financial management. There's fewer leadership training forms in year three, but there's some bigger responsibilities with those in year three. Um, in addition, they set goals. I mean, that, that's how you learn skills. You, 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 I got to be honest with you. Nobody learns skills by listening to something. Then nobody learns skills by reading a book. You just do not. You learn skills by applying what you've learned. And so we talk and teach in there this idea that every time there's a training of any kind, and, and this ought to be a lifelong pattern, not just the three-year pattern, what goal are you going to set to implement what you've learned and have it become a skill, develop it as a skill, not an idea, but a skill. And so in a sense, we at each leadership training forum, we provide a list of some possible goals, but it's their responsibility to work with their guide and identify what are they going to take on as a goal that typically, not always, would be accomplished before the next leadership training forum next month. There's obviously times they take on goals that it'll take longer than a month to accomplish, but then those goals are real. They have a time frame. They have some sense of urgency. They have a relevancy because they just received the training and the guidance and understood why it's so important to develop this principle and, and, and work to develop it as a skill. And that's the pattern that's been so effective and become so noticeable in their progress and their ability to become better and better leaders. Number four, every year, the, each of the three years, the participants all take on a project. And it's meant to be a challenging project that stretches them and gets them out of their comfort zone. And it's going to be a good project if it stretches them, if it's specific, if it benefits the firm, if it benefits them, there's growth for them, if it's measurable, and if there's a time frame. The time frame we give them is they've got until the end of the fiscal year each year, the program to accomplish their project. And they've got to put a minimum of 10 hours of work, their work, into the project. We know it's going to stretch them if it's something they haven't done before, if it's something that's not going to be easy, if it's something that gets them out of their comfort zone, if it's something that's going to take their absolute best effort. Um, that's how we know. And so we give a lot of guidance to them and to their guides about how to select a project. And then, of course, we got samples of having a, over, well over a thousand people that uh, uh, way over that, that have gone through the program. We've got examples of goals that we can share with them in different areas so they can get ideas. But each year, they, they work on that. We want it to tie to the firm. We want it to benefit the firm. And um, it becomes a significant part of stepping stones to become a better leader. And I'm I'm always blown away every year as I'm connected with firm leaders and with participants and with their goals about the impact of really good goals on an individual and on the firm. And uh, we've got so many stories to tell in those areas that, that, that can be helpful in helping somebody identify a good project. The fifth aspect of the program is just measuring the progress. As I mentioned earlier, we developed a, a, a web-based tool called the Online Progress Tracking System. And that's where we use to track everything. We can track progress on their goals. We can track progress on their projects throughout the year. It's where they can network with other program participants. And by the way, I ought to mention, a lot of the goals that we're seeing are, are, are team goals. It, it's, not, it's not always just one individual taking on something. In many cases, it might be two or three or four or five, depending on what the goal is. And they might all be from the same firm. There's times when participants get to know each other, and there's times when they know them from other firms and their associations they belong to where they team up on goals, and, and then you're, developed, you're, you're getting the benefit of not just um, collective thought and horsepower and ideas, but you're also getting the networking 
uh, benefit of that. So we're not at all opposed to the teaming up on 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 uh, the goals that they set each year. And there's a fair amount that of that that goes on. In the ops system, every participant, every guide, every ELA advocate, they have a unique login code. They can access all the information that's on that. Uh, firms receive a lot of information about best practices, about best practices for selecting goals and various things throughout that a three-year period that, that a participant's in the program. Um, everything the participant needs is is there on the ops system. All the recorded ones, the the, the notes, the, the the guidelines, the 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 ability to track a, a goal, the ability to see other goals, the ability to see their peers and and interact with them. And the same thing for guides, for the guide training and all of that. Everything is on the ops system, and it's really easy to use. Um, and, and they have a password to be able to access that and get the information that they need. Um, networking in a major upstream academy uh, event. Um, this is a big part. I, obviously, prior to the pandemic, this was, I mean, the conferences that we held were, were, were just off the charts for the, the participants. I mean, the, the common always time was, this is the best conference I've ever been to in my life. and they. They literally were. Certainly the pandemic hit last year, and that changes a lot of things. And it won't last forever, but it's currently uh, under, still under wraps right now on that. And so all the conferences for this, this next uh, ELA program are, are going to be held virtually. And w by the way, we've been doing virtual conferences. Uh, we, we didn't do them reluctantly. It's how we did them. But, but I'll tell you, the, the feedback has been wow, this is way, way better, way more helpful than I even thought it would be. This is really good. It's easy to follow. It's easy to, and we throw, we, we throw them into breakout groups all the time in Zoom and have them brainstorm things and come back with solutions and thoughts and ideas and so they get to network with peers. The difference is, obviously, we're not there face-to-face. -face. We're not there physically. It does recuse, uh, reduce travel costs and time and those kinds of things, but Honestly, as soon as we're able to, we will go back to conferences face-to-face. Uh, -face. But right now, the conferences are virtual, with the exception of one conference that will be an in-person conference. It will be held on January 13th and 14th, 2022. It will be in Las Vegas. We are at the Videra, one of our favorite hotels. Uh, that's just a great hotel. It's off the strip. It's, it's not got the casinos and all the other things in it. Yet it's, it's close to, it's in downtown, but like a block off the strip. But it is a classy, great hotel. And, um, we are going to make that one conference available as an addition for those that they'll get the virtual conferences. There'll be three of them throughout the year that they will get and sign up for. And, and put on their calendar, and I think they'll find those really helpful. There will be one face-to-face -face conference during this next fiscal year of the program. It starts again in, 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 in really it starts in June and ends in May. And there will be one conference in January. It will be limited. It will be capped at 100 participants, and there'll be an extra cost of 550 that covers costs and things for those that want to go to that. It's a two-day conference and really a day and a half conference in time. So that will be available. We're, we're acting under the assumption that by January, uh, a year from now, we'll be able to hold a conference and we'll be able to do it there at the Videra in um, Las Vegas. The consultants I've already mentioned, uh, myself and Jeremy that will be teaching that. Um, Jeremy's gonna be the next uh, managing partner of Upstream Academies, incredibly bright. By the way, Jeremy came through the ELA program, graduated probably, I don't know, five years, seven years ago. I don't know how long it was now that Jeremy graduated from that, but just an absolute incredible human being and so good at what he does as a speaker and a teacher and, and an example, really. And uh, the two of us will be teaching the ELA program. Uh, it, with every single thing we do in Upstream Academy, it comes with an unconditional guarantee. I, I, I mean, that the, the wording is right there. If you're not completely satisfied, we will at your option either waive your fee or accept that portion of the fee that reflects your level of satisfaction. We have always stood behind that 100%. That, that 
We need to do that because that gives us the idea that, man, the things we do better be really, really good or they're free. And, and so you need to understand we stand behind that. And that's your choice. That's your your satisfaction, not ours. And so that's that's been an unconditional guarantee. And I think that drives us always to to to, to do things that are impactful and, 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 and make a difference. And if we tell you it's going to make a difference in an individual, then you ought to demand to see the difference in that individual and not pay if you don't. That that's really how I see it. So, CPE uh, the CPE is based on 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 you know the 50 minutes per hour. Uh, we we belong to NASBA. We follow that very closely. So there's CPE for the leadership training forums if you attend them live. There's there's CPE for the guide train. There's CPE for the conferences, the virtual conferences. Certainly, obviously, there's CPE for that conference that will be in Vegas in January of 2022. And then, as I mentioned, the investment for that. Um, the sign-up is May 15th. That, that's the deadline to sign up for the program. And I, I'm always encouraging firms, hit the deadline because it's a whole lot of work for our teams that sign up and get people registered and do all the things they need to do with so many people that sign up to, to be doing that after May 15th. And so there's there's a bit of a kicker to do it before. The investment for each participant, it's $3,400 per person per year. We have something called Upstream Academy Network. Uh, it's got right at 100 firms that are in it now. Any firm can join it. It's, I think, I'm gonna, I think it's 3,500 bucks a year to join Upstream Academy. There's all kinds of benefits they get, but one benefit obviously they get is the discount on everything we do. So for our UAN members, those hundred firms, they pay twenty nine hundred dollars per person per year, and then after May fifteenth, the price goes up uh, two hundred fifty bucks. So just we're always encouraging people just hit the May fifteenth date. You save money. It saves a lot of headache for us as we're signing so many people up and stuff. That is the total cost. The only additional cost would be if somebody decided they wanted to come to that conference. Then they're going to pay that extra 550, and they're going to pay their own travel and and and, and lodging. Um, and and we we do provide a lot of meals at the conference, full breakfast every day, and and, and lunch, and 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 a, we have a, a breakout or a, a oh a, a get together hors d'oeuvres and stuff in the evening of the first day. But um, they would be providing those. You would need to be providing those additional costs for those individuals that signed up for that January. 2022 conference if the participants in fact wanted to do that but other than that all the cost uh, guide training advocate training all of that is built into that thirty four hundred dollars per year or or the twenty nine hundred if, if it's a, a upstream academy network member let me give you key dates and then see if you've got any questions at all that that uh that that you want to ask and i'll take any of those let's see the deadline to register is may 15th um the the first leadership training form starts in june this year it's later june because of just some things on the calendar but it starts in june with setting and accomplishing goals and then becoming a high yield low maintenance member uh it gives you the time every leadership training form will follow that time for three years so it's it, it's it's really going to be noon uh, pacific one mountain two Eastern or, or two Central, three Eastern, and they go for an hour. The intro webinar for new guides is going to be on June 30th. The guide webinars, uh, I told you each year there's three. They're, they're a trimester apart. They'll start on July 12th. There's one on October 26th. There's one the following year, January 10th. Those all last an hour. Those are all at 9 uh, a.m. Mountain. And again, I'll, I'll probably give most of those. I'm sure Jeremy will give at least one or two of those this next year. Um, but that's the training for the guides. So those will give you the dates for, for the program. I'm, I'm just going to give this to you because you can email any questions to myself or to Jeremy a, a after this is done. But let me take any of these that have come in right now. One question, is the program a three-year program? So the actual cost is approximately 10 K per participant. Yes, over three years. It's a three year program. Now, listen, let me explain that just for a minute. You're not paying for the three years up front. Um, so so th there would be, and let me explain one question that 
maybe save you, save you sending it in if somebody is thinking that because it's a logical question. Hey Sam, what if I put somebody in the program and what if something happens that that year two they can't continue? I mean, heaven forbid they, they can't health wise or they've left the firm or whatever. You're paying each year for the program at the beginning of the year. I, I'll just tell you how we work at Upstream. It's really straightforward. If something happens during the year, we had a well, I, it was a, a tragedy, a, a, a participant, their son got hit by a truck and killed. And, and, and from an emotional state, this individual just couldn't continue. And this was years ago. And she was maybe three months into the program. We just refunded the money and just said, look, when you're ready and able and you want to, you come back into the program, which later she did and, and, and completed the program. We're just always straightforward and trying to make sure that what you're paying for is stuff that you get, not stuff that you don't. So, yes, it is a three-year program. You choose each year to re-enroll. We have a very high rate, as you might guess, of re-enrollment every single year. Uh, there's a very low attrition rate in the ELA program, but there is some for various reasons. But, yeah, you pay each year, and collectively over three years, it will be right at ten grand for somebody for those three years. There are, again – no cost for for guides and advocates to receive training in the program. And by the way, guides can call us at any time. There, there's no charge for that. They can set up a call, and we get a lot of calls from guides. Another question, how often are the in-person conferences once they are allowed? That's a really good question, but it, it's easily answered. There's really, even when the pandemic is gone, so go even back to pre-pandemic days, there's only one conference a year they'll attend. There, there's five conferences a year that they, they could pick from, but they're only going to attend one. So as I said from the very beginning, the design of the program was minimize travel, and, and we feel like we could very effectively teach remotely. That's why when the pandemic came, it wasn't like a big step back for ELA, because from its very design, a lot of the, the training happens remotely, but we do want them to have the face-to-face and the connectivity, but if you can understand this, when you get five or 600 people in the program, you don't want five or 600 in one conference. You would never have the interaction. You would, uh, it, it doesn't enhance learning to have five or 600 in a conference. So every year there's been five conferences or so, and the schedule's out there in advance, and as an individual, they pick which conference, which dates, which locations they want to come to, and um, they pick that each year, and they pick one. So there's always going to be one face-to-face -face conference each year going forward once the pandemic's done. There will always be one that they will attend. They will pick in advance which one they want to come. There's always some in September. There's always some in January. And then in the past, we've always had one in July and one in October. And they pick the date and the location. Another question. Given the differing size of firms that participate, and let me just uh, parenthetically say that's very accurate. If, if I said there's well over 100 firms, if, if you were to look at uh, IPA's list of firms, gosh, there's firms in the top 50, there's firms in the top 100, there's firms in the top 200, 300, 400. So that's very true. Given the differing size of firms that participate, do you find that the larger firms use this exclusively as their emerging leader program, or do they do this as a supplement to other training that they may provide in this area? They use this as a supplement, the largest firms. No doubt. Every, every large firm that I know, and I, I know most of them, has their own training programs. But, but let me, again tell you how most of them, not all of them, but how most of them use ELA. They develop their own training. They, 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 every manager goes through, and, and whatever the titles, every manager goes through training. Every senior manager goes through training. They have used ELA for those of each group that are their best and brightest. That's just largely how they've done it. So um, if I take a firm, I don't want to necessarily mention firms by name, but I will mention one. If I take a BKD and say, how does BKD use that program? They have a lot of their own training. They have an incredible learning and development department. Greg Cole leads that. He's just, he's one of the brightest guys I know. They have a great program that they get training for. 
those individuals within their firm, um, usually about two, three years out from partner, um, that are there, I'll just use my own term. This is not their term. Rock stars and superstars, they all go through ELA. And that's how they look at it. That, that it, it stretches them. It challenges them. It's different. It, 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 in a sense, it internally recognizes those that are on a faster path, a, a higher path. And these individuals, if I look back now over the years, I can't even begin to tell you how many individuals are now managing partners of their firms, their, their, their picks, uh, partners in charge of offices. There's partners in charge of, of uh, service areas and, and segments and industry groups and niches and uh, they're, they're the they're the rock stars and superstars and that's really what ELA is designed for. There, one one last question, um, and I'm, re I'm going to read this in a way that I don't I, I don't disclose who's asking the question. So, so what I'm getting from the question is is if we've got somebody that Here's what I take from this. If, if, if I'm not reading this correctly, send me an email. There's my email address on the screen that you can see. But if we've got somebody that, that has great ability, but we have lots of frustration with, will the program help them? Um, I, there's, I, don't, I don't know that there's any pixie dust in the program. I, first of all, somebody that gets in the program needs to really want to work for, for their advancement. If there's a sense of entitlement, hey, I've been around long enough, you ought to make me a partner, they're going to they're gonna come into ELA and think, holy smokes, what am I doing here? I already ought to be a partner. They're going to probably hate the program because it's a work program. I already said it's not a boondoggle. It's also not a program that, that, that its focus is to fix somebody. you got to realize the people that we get in the program are incredibly good and talented they blow us away how good they are in many many cases they're rock stars and, and so that's who they're going to see themselves with and those people are amazing because number one they're already rock stars and number two they're wanting to work like crazy for their career for their advancement in their career now that might inspire somebody and wake them up and say man if these people are that good they're working that hard i ought to wake up but it's not a program to save somebody and 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 we would prefer not to have prisoners in the program, people that don't want to be there, thought they should already be a partner or whatever. So, again, I go back to it's a perfect program when somebody's advancing rapidly, impressing the heck out of everybody. It will move them to an even higher level, and they'll do it rapidly because those are the people that want to work for it. Um, and, and, and they will absolutely love the program, even though it works them. One last question. How much time will somebody spend on an annual basis in the program? And that's a really good question. And I'm only giving it to you as an estimate because it's going to vary by individual. But for years, since we've had it since 2007, we've asked that question year after year of participants. How much time have you spent? And it probably is somewhere between uh, 40 hours a year and 70 to 80 hours a year. I know that's quite a span, but if you think about it, they, they, they sit through uh, 10 leadership training forums. We don't teach them in March and April because you're, you're, you're speaking to yourself in those two months in our profession anyway. So there's, there's 10 of those a year. They're going to meet with their guide every month for probably an hour. So there's, there's 10 hours there a year. They're going to work on a project for 10 hours minimum a year. They're going to attend a conference, virtual or face-to-face. -face. And so you can look at that and easily see that that would add up to 40 at a minimum. Many people have told us they spend more time than that because they work more on their project. They're, they're, they're setting and accomplishing goals each week and, or each month, excuse me. And so it's easy to see that somebody would spend 50 to 60 hours. Some could spend more than that in a year. That's why I described it as a work program and not a boondoggle. Uh, interestingly enough, some who have advanced the fastest have really bested themselves most in it and, and probably more that 70 to 80 hours that, that they may spend because they're applying what they're learning all the time and they may be counting those hours. I hope that was helpful to you. Please, if you get any questions, email them to me. I'd be happy to to ask, this has been recorded, so this recording within a day or two will be available if you want anyone else to be able to listen to it. Best wishes. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a great day. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.